I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this, and he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. You mentioned in the beginning all of the rejections, and most people I know who have gone out to L.A. to try to be actors have sooner or later quit after the first 100 rejections. How did you find the resilience? Is it realizing this core authenticity that... You're an actor and you know you have it, or what is it? No, I work with young actors all the time, and I tell them, and I'm not trying to be a tough guy because I'm not, but I tell them, if you have a plan B, if you're just going to come out here for a year or two, whether it's New York or Los Angeles, um, and you have a plan B, definitely do the plan B, because it's going to work out better. Hmm. You asked me why I did it. I had to do it. I had to. There was no, it was as clear as day, this is what I had to do. To me, in my core, I knew I had to participate in storytelling. I didn't know what that looked like, but I knew I was going to be a storyteller. But that's interesting, though. So you had an umbrella storytelling as opposed to, like, I'm going to be an action hero in a movie. 100%. How do you think somebody can find what it is they have to do? Because you sort of fell into it as a young age, but now we live in this world where jobs and industries are changing, people are trying to figure out what their second, third, even fourth lives are into older age. You know, but they've been so used to being, oh, I'm going to just show up for my cubicle every day. How do you, how do you break out of that? All right, I'm here once again with John McGinley, one of the most impressive actors in history. I'm sorry I have to, to build you up that way. I don't, I don't know if... Uh, some people don't like being introduced. Uh, I would suggest to you most actors are not afraid of positive reinforcement. <laughs> Since we get rejected for a living, you got to remember, if you play baseball, I, I found this out, if you play baseball and you go to the Hall of Fame, and if you're an offensive producing uh, member of the Hall of Fame, so in other words, this does not factor in pitchers, but guess what the mean average is for offensive producing players in Cooperstown? Uh, I'm not going to guess, but I'm just going to ask Steve, my podcast producer, who knows every statistic. Steve, can you guess? About what the average is for baseball players? Yeah, let's say the hit batting average. Probably. For, for, for a Hall of Fame. Oh, for the Hall of Fame, it's probably 300, right? No, 300 can't be. Is it 300? Is that? It's 302. 302. And what that, so well you were done. at the 2100. What, what that means is that you failed 698 times out of 1,000. And that's really interesting because what actors do is fail at an even greater rate. Uh, you, you can ask any of us. We'll go to, especially early on when we audition a ton, we'll, uh, as you did, uh, we'll audition 30 times and get zero. And so we're not even batting 302. 
But if we do hit one or two out of 100, which is brutal, um, the bottom line is we're not rejecting. So if you were a cup, a cup salesman, um, you could go home at night and reconcile the rejection that the cup is just shaped a little wrong. It's not me, it, the cup is a little wrong. When, when actors get rejected, we're rejecting you. We don't want you. We don't we're want doing the movie, we're doing the play, we're just not doing it with you. And that hurts. And so the trap is your skin gets a little too thick. And if you get too thick and too, too leathery, then you lose your loveliness and what, what made you different and what made you sensitive and what made you able to, to tap into what hurts and loss and pain. What, why do you lose that? Because I would think still Because being able- it hurts so much. It mm. hurts, rejection hurts. We're not rejecting the coffee cup. We're doing the film. We're just not doing it with you. We're gonna do it with someone who looks just like you. We're not gonna go, we're not gonna cross uh, gender it. We're not gonna go with a woman. We're actually gonna go with someone who looks just like you, but not you. And if that happens a couple of hundred times, which it's going to, if you're lucky enough to persevere, that hurts. And, and this is coming from a person who's been in, you know, nine se- seasons of a hit TV series, Scrubs. This is the, your, your third season of Stand Against Evil, which is on IFC. It's premiering on Halloween, October 31st. Congratulations, Thank by you. the way. You've been in, just to go down your IMDb, it's like you've been in a gazillion movies, but how many, what, how many, what's the number of movies? It seems like 30 or 40 movies you've been in. No, it's about 80. 80 movies and it was six Oliver Stone movies. You've been in like a mega movies where you're well known from them, if, even if not for Scrubs. Uh, and you're saying you've gotten rejected. And you, you're, so you're like a Hall of Fame actor and you're saying you've gotten rejected much worse than Hall of Fame statistics. <laughs> Every actor has. Every, any actor who tells you they haven't was probably a really beautiful boy or girl and they had about a year or two where they got everything. And then <laughs> they shit the bed. So even you going, doing that, shh, I can't even do that sound. That's, but what, that's what does like that a, mean, anything? But that, no, but that's like, I feel like even doing something like that is like a good audition sound. Like, cause uh, it's put, it makes you stand out. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you, that's called a Felix the Cat bag of tricks. And I, I coach actors on that all the time. See, I knew it was something not different. to use. <laughs> ah, okay. You don't use your Felix the Cat bag of tricks cause it gets old and then you become like this vaudeville little jackass. Mm. But people just want to see your truth. Not just, that's a horrible thing. People want to see your truth. But doesn't, do, doesn't your truth often change? And like you say, you of build, course, a, you build a thick skin, so then your truth changes just because of that. Your truth is gonna change because your life changes and that informs what's genuine to you. And that's what the camera's gonna, the camera's an x-ray machine. And so the minute you st- step in front of a camera, it can see your truth. And so in other words, when an actor is playing a doctor or a boxer or, or a lawyer, they're not, doctors or lawyers or, 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 or boxers, they're just some jackass from Jersey. And so what that actor has to do is find a way to reduce how egregious that lie is. Cause you're telling a lie when you go and play somebody, you're not that person, you're just some guy. And so how do you do that? Every, every actor has a, a different approach to it, but you have to find a way to not lie. So you reduce the profundity of the lie in front of the lens. And then the lens is a little more friendly. So like, so like we'll go back and forth with, with Stand Against Evil because that's about to come out and I've, I've watched you in it and, and you do great in it. You play Sheriff Miller, the main character. It's this uh, uh, weird mix of sitcom slash horror. Yeah, it's uh, Archie Bunker fighting witches. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I've heard you describe it, like Archie Bunker fighting witches. And Dana Gould, who's been a great comedian since the 90s, he wrote on The Simpsons, he's the- uh, You ran the writer's room in The Simpsons for 10 years. Yeah, Imagine just, the emotional Kevlar you had to strap on every day to go into that room. Yeah, and, and, and the skill set he had to build. each other. But, it, but at the same time, it's, it's odd to do a horror comedy. It's almost like people can't figure, it, figure out, oh, am I watching, is this gonna scare me or am I gonna laugh? Like they wanna know beforehand in this kind of like, you know, very catered media world right now. But, but before we get into that, when you're, you know, uh, like let's say in season one, you're dealing with um, some, some trauma and loss and I could see it on your face. What are, you, what are you thinking to bring that truth to the camera? Considering too that 
the plot the plot is very uh it's it's this lighthearted horror so it's not it's complicated to play in i imagine yeah the first thing i told the dana gould who was the executive producer and creator of stand against evil was that he sent me all eight eight episodes and i thought they were really good and i said you've you you've you're responsible for catalyzing a notion in my head because it was born off the page that you wrote. And I said, you're missing the fact that this guy's really damaged. He's wounded. And we find out in the first three minutes of the pilot that he's lost his wife of 27 years and he's been fired from his job at 26 years. Well, if that happened to most of us- 28 years. 28 years, <laughs> that would be very disorienting. So what are you gonna, you have this guy who now just wants to go sit on his uh, recliner and watch the History Channel, but he can't even do that because 172 witches are trying to kill him, which is great, all that's great, but what about this guy's wounds? What are you gonna do about this guy? He's suffering. He, he look, Stan against the Stan, the protagonist, was culled out of the Arch Archie Bunker archetype. And the only reason Archie floated and that we forgave him his transgressions is because of Gene Stapleton, it's because of Edith because Edith loved him. And if she loved him, there must be something there. And the only reason we forgive Stan his transgressions as an equal opportunity offender is because the loss of Claire and the fact that he can't reconcile that. Like most of us, it's very hard to reconcile loss. And when men are wounded, what actors, everybody I know who's a great actor, what we do for a living is study men and the human condition. And so I, I said, we have to study this guy's loss not, it's a horror comedy. We don't have to put it up on a billboard, but what has to ground this thing, the ballast, and the reason we'll forgive Stan and not change the channel because he's a jackass is because he's wounded. And what is he gonna do? What can he do? What does he wanna do about these wounds while witches are trying to kill him? That has to be what floats it. So, so, so for instance, let's, I'm just trying to think of scenes from that, that pilot, like uh, when you're, when you're talking to your daughter and you talk about the room that your, you know, your ex-wife and the or your your deceased wife in the show never allowed you in, there's like this expression on your face, this sadness. You're you don't want to go into that room. What are you thinking in your head to kind of produce that sadness? I'm thinking about loss in my life, and that's what every actor has. If he or she can is brave enough and and has been given the conditions to explore, in that case, loss, then we can pull from that. Okay, can I ask you what loss you were thinking of? Uh, my father had passed a year or two before that, and I tap into, it's a, that's a rich, that's a, in an Irish Catholic family with the patriarch as strong as my family, um, as, as strong as my father was, that informs everything I do. Did you, um, how, so he had just passed, was, was he proud of you going into acting yes. and your success? Uh, did, was there ever a moment like now with Stand Against Evil, you wish he could have seen you kind of bring No, this he cut to that. My cup was full by the time my father passed because he was well enough to come and see. We did a revival of Glengarry Glen Ross on Broadway a couple of years ago with Al Pacino and Bobby Cannavale. And I got to play Dave Moss, which is a really shiny part in the play. And dad was well enough to come to the Schoenfeld uh, where we played and see that. And that was the most, uh, that's the greatest experience I've ever had uh, acting. And dad got to be part of that. And so my cup was full. Because hopefully for the next X, X number of years here, there'll be other things that are exciting and all. But that was, that was, that was the, the peak for me. So, so well, let me say this, it was the most exciting thing I've ever done. And, and in part it's because your father gets to see the, the the result of all these years of, of hard work and success and so and on. Maybe tangentially, but, uh, or peripherally rather. I, I, no, it, it, it was exciting because at my core, it was the hardest thing I ever did. Everything I'd done before added up to it. Um, Broadway, as you probably know, is eight, eight shows a week. I was with Al, I was with Bobby, Richard Schiff, David Harbour, this bulletproof ensemble, which was just rock and roll. And every night it was, uh, it was completely thrilling. You know, it, it, I, and, and I know we're going off on tangents as, as we always do. Um, we're, we're always gonna get, I just want you to know, we're always gonna get back to Stand Against Evil because I know I'm it's coming out. I'm with you 100%. To, but, uh, but I always wonder on Broadway acting, A, does it get boring doing the same show every single day for potentially months at a time? 
we signed up to do 100 performances. Your question is really good. I did, I created the role of Stu, the engineer in talk radio with Eric Bogosian down at the public. And I did it because offers, you know, their offers weren't, I wasn't being bombarded by offers. And so when you're doing an off-Broadway play, you make about $340 a week and that beats waiting tables. And I did the play for two years because I wasn't, uh, nobody was saying, hey, McGinley, we need you over here. And so it was a big hit down at the public and Eric Bogosian did the play for about a year. And then other actors came in and played Barry Champlain, the protagonist. And I took away from that, that I can't do something that long. It was too, it did, I, I could, after a while, phone it in a little bit. Uh, and then the, the other- The opposite of that is, a finite number of performances. We all, because everybody had films to go to when we were doing the revival of Glen Gary. So Al and Bobby and myself, everybody agreed to do 100 performances. And so you could leave it all out there. You didn't have to, you didn't have to keep in, you didn't have to preserve anything because it was 100. So it was right after Sandy happened, the Hurricane Sandy. And so we were postponed for about a week or two. And then it was a sprint. And did you find in the hundred, did you see among you and the other actors, because you knew it was going to be a hundred, it's almost like this laboratory. Could you, could you find you could like tweak and, and nuance different, different lines in the play to, to test the audience reaction? And you can tweak the timing, but Mamet is to our generation as Shakespeare was to other groups. And, and he, the greatest play written for men in my lifetime is Glengarry. Hmm. And now I think there's gonna be a female version of it in a year or two um, where all the cast is females. And I'm sure David will tweak that. But the answer to your question is, no, you can't touch the language, um, but you can, and I fell in love with, um, there's something called a Jack Benny pause. And Benny used to, and I just went to the Museum of Broadcast now 10 years ago and started to watch him doing this thing where he'd insinuate these pauses into the meter and it, it makes the audience, and it takes spine. It makes them lean in. And you gotta know when you're, if you start milking it, you've, you've trespassed into something naughty. But you put these Jack Benny pauses in and it makes them lean in. And it takes spine to do it in a Broadway play. Yeah, because the, I mean, again, we're, right now we're, stand, we're sitting on a, the stage of a stand up comedy club. No one's in the audience, but standing up here, it's like you said, you want them to lean in a little bit. Pause is, is very important in the delivery of a comedian. You're, you're a comic actor, uh, but sometimes that pause just means a quarter second, but it feels like forever. 100%. And especially if it's a sold out Schoenfeld Theater, which is a tiny house, it's only about 1,200 seats. Um, the run was sold out. The 100 performances were sold out. Nobody was there by mistake. They were all there to see Bobby and Al and to see Al um, play uh, Shelley, the machine, Levine, you know, and, and to see Bobby uh, play the slick role that Al played in the movie. Uh, and so if you're gonna start doing experimental theater up on the stage, you're doing the wrong thing. So as you were suggesting, a, a quarter of a second, a Benny pause is, as I've come to find out, is just something that makes them lean in a little bit. But man, when you start, when you start, I was with Richard Schiff for the first 17 minutes on stage, and I'm just trying to get him to rob the real estate place. And so he, I don't, Richard's not allowed to talk for 17 minutes. And if he does, I've failed. And it's just this rat-a-tat-tat the whole time. And it's 17 minutes and it doesn't stop. And Richard tries to get a word in and it, David, the way Mamet puts it on the page, it's no. And every time he tries to rationalize his way out of it, I got another one for you. And then he tries to say, but I can't, but I got another one for you. And it's, it's genius and it's, it's, it's man work. It's not for the fucking faint of heart. Well, and, and so I imagine like, as opposed to let's say TV, like from, from the point of view of the audience, we're watching an experience from beginning to end. But on TV, when you're shooting it, if you mess up, they just reshoot it. Maybe they reshoot it 20 times for the sake of the editor. Or maybe they shoot it, reshoot some scenes because you, you want to reshoot it or the right one. But in a play, you got to get it right or the entire audience knows, you know, the other cast knows. Uh, do you feel like being in a play improves your skills acting for the screen or vice versa? Like, and I'm sure they're different, so maybe it's a naive question, but which direction is more important for improving the skills of the other? I don't, I don't know. I, neither one, they both inform each other. I don't know which one's better, 
But when you're doing a play and you're doing it, uh, a Broadway schedule is two matinees and six nights. So it's eight shows a week. You literally have to put, you know, in the Kentucky Derby, those horses wear blinders. Everything else has to be be put aside. You can't, you can't have fights in your family. All that shit's going to have to wait. Everything else is going to have to wait because you're going on this afternoon at two and then you're going back on at eight. And no one gives a fuck that your aunt just died in Philadelphia. They paid $450 to sit in the third row twice. So that's almost $1,000. And they, pay, they, had, they had dinner at, at Gotham. They came up here. We're almost two grand into this night. And because your aunt died in I'm making this up, but because your aunt died in Philadelphia, you, you got off track in that scene with Richard Schiff. Fuck you. Get it, no. How do you turn it off? You turn it the fuck off. But you know, it's funny because you have to turn it off, but still play your truth. You know, your truth is you're doing this play. Yeah. You're one of five or six people in this play. You're one of the principals in this play. It's the opportunity of a goddamn lifetime. Get involved or get the fuck out. And all that stuff has to be as clear as day. If you're gonna if you're gonna drink too much, if you're gonna do too much blow, whatever your challenges are, that has to stop. You can go back to it 100 performances from now, but it has to stop. Because what's the, obviously there's some discipline that you've some. built up. Right, huge. So, so what, is, what is the discipline? How do you create that? The discipline is that? you're responsible for your instrument, first and foremost. Your instrument is this. And what Every, do you do to work on that instrument? You have to find a way to preserve your voice so that when you're shouting it, during the mount, matinee, that it's, it's from down here. It's supported like baby breath. It's not up here. Because if you lose your voice and your understudy has to go on at eight o'clock tonight for the eight o'clock, you're a jackass. Mm -hmm. If you have a fight, uh, you have to figure out how to grab James's elbow and turn him so that he lands right, which is called combat on stage, so that you don't tweak your shoulder. You mm -hmm. can't tweak that shoulder. Mm -hmm. We owe 100 performances of this because that's gonna become chronic. And now you're gonna do this weird thing with your shoulder every night because you got hurt the, the, during the, two, the, the Wednesday night show last week. So we have to figure that out. We're responsible for our instruments. And then, but, and then but there's things you have to do off stage. Like you, you say, you have to be able to, like, let's say, I don't know, there's tensions between you and your spouse. What does the word sublimate mean? And I'm not being a wise guy. I don't know. Does it mean to acquiesce and, and take a back seat to something? Uh, I don't know either. <laughs> I think everything I feel like I can use it in a sentence, but I don't know what I it means. I think everything has to be sublimated to uh, support doing eight a week, mm. nothing else matters. So you learn, but that, it's interesting. Like when people talk about acting, they talk about, oh, do you use method or miser? And we talked about this on the last podcast, but, but there's actually this deeper skill, which is all around your life. How do you make your life conducive I to agree. the performance you have to do at 8 p.m.? And these things are just as important as, oh, are you doing method or miser or whatever? Right, did you, did you take the time and I, I learned most of this during that two-year run. Off-Broadway is also eight a week. We did eight a week on talk radio. And everything, there's this horrible story, but it's kind of a great story. I, I was doing, at one point, it was the actor's, New York actor's dream. Um, talk radio was a hit at the public. It was a massive hit. Uh, in other words, there's only 320 seats. The biggest room down at the Shakespeare Festival is about 320 seats. And so it was packed. Eric was, Eric was all the rage in Manhattan. And concurrently with that, for about three weeks, I got to do Wall Street down at the Woolworth building, which is where we were shooting during the day on that trading floor. I was only in one interior in that movie, this massive trading floor. And then at night, I would come straight up Lafayette, all the way down, for, all the way up from the Woolworth building to the Astor Library, which is where Mr. Papp's place was. And Oliver kept keeping me later and later. And in the, the language of my contract, I had to be wrapped every day at seven because I like I liked to be there at half hour. There's something called equity half hour. So all the actors have to be at the theater 30 minutes before the show starts. That's called equity half hour. And I like to be there. I like to do a vocal warm up. I like to stretch. I like to do all the actor bullshit that people make fun of. I like to do all that stuff. And it's to preserve the instrument. And so Oliver kept this later and later. He kept fucking with Charlie and I. And I'm getting there now at uh, 20 of, I'm getting there at quarter of, the Teamsters are going as fast as they can up Lafayette. I'm getting there at five of. And one night I got there at places. And 
Oh, I get nervous even thinking about this. And so I got there in the yeah, stage. Yeah, you just got you just got stressed. You were like rubbing yeah. your legs. Well, I, I, the stage manager said, John, you can't go on tonight. I'm like, well, yes, I can. I am. And um, in talk radio, the stage was not, it was kind of a medium thrust stage like this. Eric is over where you are, and I'm on stage at three quarters to the audience, feeding you phone calls the whole time. And about 20 minutes into the play, the closest middle spot to the audience in a lighting cue anywhere on the planet is called down in one. That's the lighting cue. And it's every actor's dream to go down in one, have a pin spot hit you in a hit play, and now you have an eight minute monologue about how my character met Eric's character and what's happened before you people came in and I can give you all this Eric backstory. And I got to co-write it as we developed the play and it was a dream. So I get to come out of my seat, go down in one and tell you the audience looking into the black abyss for eight minutes and I'm weeping by the end of this. It was an actor showcase um, about how, I, how his character Barry Champlain impacted my character Stu. And so this night where uh, I get there at places, I, I tell the, the understudy, get out of my fucking wardrobe, I'm going on. And so they let me, they placated me. And so about 20 minutes into the play, I start this monologue out, I turn to the audience, I get up about a minute into it, I go down in one. I can't remember the next line, it wasn't there. And I sat there, I stood there in front of the audience. I'm sure it was really fascinating to see an actor die in front of you. Did the audience know you were dying? Of course. Huh. And if it was 30 seconds, it was a minute, but I can't barely tell the story. Um, I, I, I almost started to, I got a little caught up. I almost started to cry. And instead I just turned and went back to my seat. Somebody called the next light cue and Eric picked it right up. And he's such a mensch after the play, he just came up to me and he hugged me and he goes, you can't do that anymore. Hmm. And he was right. And the next day, Oliver kept me till uh, 8.15 and my understudy went on and guess what? The world didn't end, it was fine. But I'm just so from the Lou Gehrig Wally Pip school where once, you, once you're in, don't get off. Don't let anybody from being from big Irish family. I'm like, no, fuck you. I'm, I can do Wall Street for 16 hours and I can come here and do that eight minute piece and I can do all this. And guess what? I can't. So, so let me ask you this. I need to do a vocal warm up, and I need to go over that eight minute piece in my head. And I need to, to re-engage what brought me and why I'm walking down here in front of all you and telling you this story. Why? Now I can tell you the story, but I can't if I'm disconnected. I'm not a good enough actor. So, well, I, I will ask you about that. But uh, when you realized you forgot the line, you still knew what you had to do. Could you have improv No, I would, as any actor would say, when you forget your line on stage, it's called going up. And I knew I'd gone up, gone up. And it was so bad. I remember when I used to pass out in church because they kept us in catechism until like 11 o'clock. And then you go to the high mass and you haven't had anything to eat since six in the morning. Now it's two o'clock. And I used to pass out in church all the time because you're kneeling and then you're standing and the blood stops going to your head. And I remember what happens when I pass out is your peripheral vision starts to close. And you, if you pass out enough, you can feel this, you can clock it. You can see your peripheral vision coming in. And I remember being on stage and I was in such a panic. I was so scared uh, that my peripheral vision started to close. And I'm like, oh fuck, I'm gonna pass out. And so I went back to my seat. I was really lightheaded and I was scared to death. And so I was you didn't crying. even wanna take the chance of, hey, I was gonna pass the, the fuck out. Huh. I knew I was gonna pass out. And I was really scared and fear is, fear is a monster. So, so my stomach is churning right now, <laughs> telling you the story. I, it gives you fear to tap into in your next- uh, It's never fear. happened again. I guarantee fucking to you. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like 
I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. It's interesting. This was, must have been about 25 years ago. 
uh, I don't know, how, how old were you then? Like in your... I don't know, so maybe, uh, let's see, I already done Platoon, so I was 26. So I was probably 30. Yeah, so... so You're I, right, it was about 25 years you, ago. You, you were working 16-hour days, then... Um, you know, going on stage for yeah, and that's hours. a New York actor's dream, right? And it's and it's high stakes, right? You're you're performing with all these incredible people. It's not like, uh, well, I mean, any anything you do, you can say is high stakes. But this was really yes. super high stakes. And at what age? And you said you said I just can't do this. But you know, the 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 energy and the ignorance of the young helps. At what age would you say you really couldn't work that hard? I don't know if it was, I can still work as hard as I need to, but I need to be in a place where I can prepare and approach what I'm doing uh, on my terms. And then, Otherwise, and I then, can't do it. And so so part of the answer is realizing the world doesn't end if the understudy, you know, if there's other solutions that don't involve you. What's what's another way you can set boundaries in those situations? I'm so not that sure you get exactly what you mean. Well, so that you, you need your downtime in between one thing and the other. You need to be able to tell an Oliver Stone. I don't Stone, need the downtime. I need whatever whatever time and preparation is imperative for me, John McGinley, which may not be, I did a play, I did a Broadway play with John Lithgow and Requiem for a Heavyweight about a boxer. And John could do a, a, a Gilbert and Sullivan patter song in the wings and then uh, turn on and, and go play this boxer. I can't do that. I got, I got to have blinders on. Like I, I can't do that. When we're in when I'm in the wings waiting to go on, when Richard Schiff and I are in the wings waiting to go on, it's a second scene in Glengarry. Um, uh, everything else has to stop. There's like Johnny Johnny Lithgow can do that. I can't. So, but in Scrubs and in Stand Against Evil, more in Stand Against Evil than in Scrubs, there's an improv component, and you're able to do that. Like you you are able to kind of turn it on somewhat. I really tell the actors, because we get the actors as one of the producers on stand, I get the actors all eight scripts about a month or two before they come down to Atlanta. And the reason I do it is because we're gonna shoot completely ass out of order. And when James and John have that scene in this interior in episodes one, five, and eight, we're shooting it all out this afternoon. We're never coming back to this interior. We don't have enough money. So unless you rehearsed those eight, eight episodes like a play when you were back in Los Angeles, you're not gonna know that you're, you're, the bomb went off in your car between episodes five and eight. And you have to know that because you're gonna be in different wardrobe and something happened between episodes five and eight. But we're shooting all your stuff right now. We're gonna shoot the master and then we're coming in on your singles for those three episodes. And unless you rehearsed that like a play and you know the arc of James's story, and what's happening, how you plug into it, we're dead. Because now I gotta babysit your ass and we're gonna slow down and we don't have time. So I really encourage the actors and encourage is a um, little bit of a slippery verb. Um, I, I really insist the actors rehearse this like a play. Now we don't have the time or money to pay for rehearsal space in Los Angeles so that I can wet nurse you and, and train you into rehearsing this like a play. You just have to do it. And that becomes real clear when you get down to Atlanta, whether you did it or not. Mm. And if you didn't, um, we'll we'll write you a lot lighter next year, mm. a lot lighter. Do people are people ever uh, afraid of disappointing you because of this? Like I could imagine if I'm on the set and you're on the set trying to decide if I prepared enough in L.A., I'm going to be scared as hell if I mess up in front of you. Some actors need a lot less preparation than I do. <laughs> but when we get down to Atlanta, remember everything that can go wrong in a set is going to. The, the, your key light's gonna go out, the, the mics are gonna stop working, stuff's gonna go wrong. And if, if that is exacerbated by the fact that you don't know your goddamn lines or you don't know the arc of your character, we're fucked. Yeah. So understand that's gonna go wrong. You can't, you so, gotta float us. So you know, it's interesting because a lot of what you're saying in terms of skill is demanded because of the limitations of IFC versus let's say a Netflix. Yeah, so we're Netflix, not going back to reshoot any of this. Right, like Netflix will spend maybe 20 million on an episode, but with IFC and, and their original program, they just can't spend as much. And, but yet Stand Against Evil, you know, just, re, re, you know, again, renewed for season three coming on, on October 31st, you're doing well versus Netflix shows, but you have this this limitation and you work around it as the, as the producer, you figure out how to, how to deal with it. How do you feel in this world where Netflix and Amazon and Hulu are just throwing 
tens of billions of dollars into original programming and you've got to compete up against that. Here's the trade-off that's worth more than any budget you could possibly give me is that at IFC, what's, what's been lovely about IFC is that you do have a desperately finite amount of time and money to shoot the scenes, but we're going to give you a wildly disproportionate amount of creative autonomy. And that means you're going to live or die on Dana and my vision and our tone and what we want to do with this piece. And I'll take that any day of the week. Mm. So in other words, you're not going to be micromanaged. We're not going to babysit your ass. You, you're free to go and shoot this. They've read all eight scripts and they've had notes on those scripts, but now you can go shoot it. And it's, an, we sub, it's very subversive what we do. And I mean, the hero is a guy who will do the right thing in the bottom of the ninth only because he doesn't want to fucking hear about it if he doesn't. And so that's great. He's not doing it to, to be Captain America. He's doing it because you don't want to hear about it. That's so subversive. It's great. And, and but so when, when does the improv fit in? Like, because there is uh, an improvisational component. I, make, I want the actors to do, because Dana Gould is such a good writer and did write for The Simpsons and ran The Simpsons writing room for 10 years, you want to say what Dana put on the page. It's not. There's nothing random about what he put on the page. He sweat over it, and I helped. I shaped what we what we're sending you. We want you to say what's on the page for the first two or three takes, and then if you have some magic sauce that your rehearsal uh, yielded, then bring it in. But because we have a finite am amount of time to shoot the James and John scene here in this location, let's shoot what what Dana wrote on the page first. And then if you have some really Elvis dust that you want to, which I told you about last yes. time, but if you have some dust you want to sprinkle on there, bring it. It's going to be great. But remember, it's a, the show is 21 minutes and 35 seconds. We have an A, B, C, and maybe a D story to fit into that. So a lot of, there's going to be a lot of, that's going to be chopped. And so if your improv isn't germane to what we're doing, and doesn't move the story forward or isn't some brilliantly eccentric thing that, that kind of in a peripheral way um, is lovely in the story, it's not gonna make it. We're gonna chop it out, because we have to. We have to, it's 21 minutes and 35 seconds, which is what you, most half hour things you consume are about 21 right. minutes and 35 seconds. We shoot probably a 40 minute show, and then you gotta chop it. And sometimes it's Sophie's choice and we'll just, We'll take some of it and we'll, we'll recycle it for next year. We'll make it an A story next year. But we have this, this ensemble that can improvise their asses off and that's good and bad. Um, sometimes impro improvisational actors can get a little lazy in as much as I want you to hew to the, the text that you have in front of you. I know you have the, all your magic stuff. I know, I know, I know. Do what Dana wrote and then for takes four or five, which is about what we're gonna do, unless the light breaks, because um, we gotta move on, uh, maybe you can bring your magic dust. And sometimes that makes it in, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. I saw it on Scrubs all the time. All the, that ensemble was so, so talented. But again, that's 21 minutes and 35 seconds. You had seven principles. It's just like being on the Lakers or the Knicks. You know, how many touches are you gonna get? How many minutes are you gonna get on the floor? Maybe not playing the whole game. And on Scrubs, your improv was sort of the uh, the shouting insults sometimes. The it, only improvs I did on on Scrubs, Billy Lawrence wrote Scrubs, and most of it, what he put on the page, you really wanted to say. It it was really good, and so sometimes I would just do uh, transitions out of a scene. I'd get us out of a scene. Hmm. That was pretty much the bandwidth where where what I did with Dr. Cox. Otherwise. You know, he used to write these random lists that I had to do that there, there was no connective tissue in these lists. And I decided that I was going to do it. I don't know why I thought this, but I decided that I wasn't going to give him a cut point. So I'd start these lists, which would, which would support, 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 and then spawn a joke. And they, I don't remember any of the lists, but I'd, I'd, I decided I wasn't going to give him a cut point. So I'd get a huge belly full of air and then I wouldn't stop, which is preposterous because we can cut away from you whenever we want. But I decided I was just going to do this Martin Scorsese syncopation and never give you a cut point. And that kind of spawned the Cox rhythm. Yeah, I mean, that li literally was like kind of this, you know, if somebody else tried to do that, they would say, oh, you're trying to act like 
John McGinley in, in Scrubs. But it was it, all fear-based, which is such an interesting thing that actors do to themselves. I was like, I was afraid that you were gonna cut away from me after I did these, these endless hours of homework on these jackass lists that were impossible. It was like memorizing the fucking Manhattan directory. And these, these words and concepts would go somewhere but Jesus Christ, it was heavy lifting getting there. And I didn't want you to cut away from me because of all the work I did. I really want to show you what I did. And that's all fear-based and it's bullshit. And it's funny because it's it's it was very comedic and it was the exact opposite of the Jack Benny pause. Because this it was sort of like this this fast uh um, what do you call it? Like tongue twister, you know, lists. Yes. You must have like really practiced each one, like. Because how do you not fumble uh, while doing it? Uh, you know, and it was fun because it was so fast and so almost intellectual. Like it was hard to say fast. That uh, that was funny. That was the funny aspect of it. Right. And and I wanted to. I was. I'm so goddamn competitive. I didn't want you to write that for anyone else. If you if you were going to give that to Cox, I I will execute it. And I just uh, I didn't sleep for like nine years. And in a good way, I was my cup was full from executing this stuff, but it it'll chop you down. And so it's it's interesting you say that. I didn't even thought of that. That that it is the antithesis of a Benny pause. And then when I did discover a Benny pause in front of twelve hundred people, it was completely liberating and new to me because I'd been doing the opposite uh, and being you know patted on the back for it this rat a tat tat cadence for nine years. And all of a sudden it was like. Wow, what happens if you make them come to you for a second? And I absolutely fell in love with it. How, how often have you tried that now? The 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 Jack Penny pause. Have you seen the it's, effect it's, of it? It's part. It's part of. It's part of. I get it now. Huh. But I was experimenting with it <laughs> on Broadway in Glengarry, which just seems preposterous to me that you McGinley think you have the right to do that on stage. But it was live and. Uh, it made, made him lean in. And I, I got myself in a position where the pause was mine. It wasn't, I owned it. It wasn't the pause I took in, in talk radio. It wasn't blacking out. It wasn't going up. I had you. I had you right the fuck here. And I was going to make you lean in. So the, the common thing in, in both of those techniques is that it's, it's out of the comfort zone. So in yeah, both way, in both ways, like we're having a conversation just back and forth. This is like within the comfort zone of a conversation. But when you do on stage something that seems a little out of the comfort zone, just how, a little, just a tiny bit, because if it's too much, like you say, the audience is an X-ray machine. They can tell you're milking it, hundred percent, and even fast or slow. So it's kind of like just being barely out of the comfort zone to increase the tension of everybody. And then you just have to release the tension a quarter second later and they laugh. So it's, it's this aspect of finding out where the comfort zone is, I guess. I was so scared getting ready to play Dave Moss in that revival and I was so overwhelmed by that ensemble. I set up a theater boot camp in Southern California. I rented a, a rehearsal space and I had a, a couple of different people I brought in. And for two months before we started rehearsal, I just pounded this thing into the ground, technically. Um, I had a, I had a, what's a thing on a, on the top of a piano that goes like this? Um, a metronome. I had a metronome. I did it at different paces, different rhythms. Uh, I had different people reading with me. Uh, I had my acting teacher come in. So, but by the time we went up to, we were rehearsing it in Ballet Hispanico. There's raw space up there and you tape the floor. And by the time we went up there to rehearse, I was so dialed and so ready to go on. And I was in my brain, I was so technically proficient I was available to what I discovered, which mm. was a Benny pause, but I couldn't have been unless I set up this, again, I was so scared because um, Dave Moss is such a freaking hard role, uh, or it was for me, uh, that by the time I got up there, I was, I was the least of your problems. And then, so, so then compare that to, uh, and now you had already worked with Al Pacino in a, in a prior movie, and now Al Pacino's on the stage with you, you had been preparing for, for months in advance of maybe every other actor, including him. How did you see any difference between your skill level for that performance and his skill level for, for that performance? Not, not necessarily better or worse, just different. Al has a different process. Al likes to um, move into the piece. I, I, what does I, that mean? 
he's okay with with baby steps and and he trusts that he's going to get there mm. i don't trust i'm going to get there i want to i want to cover all my bets i want to cover everything especially the words and it's informed by going up and talk radio and the one thing that wasn't going to happen and it didn't it didn't even come close was that the words were going to be an issue mm. uh everything else could go wrong um but richard and i were going to be bulletproof in that first act and then and then when you watch um Al Pacino on stage was so, you know, just for- I watched for, in the wings every night for a hundred. I'd stand in, the, all of us would just stand in the wings and watch. And and obviously he's been one of the, the greats for probably 50 years now. Uh, what what stands out to, as, as a seasoned professional versus, you know, someone who just sees him in the Godfather or whatever, what stands out in terms of the nuances of what makes Al Pacino so so great, particularly when you're performing alongside of him? that he's 70 plus and can do eight shows a week and and be have his instrument available and and be able to to push that i mean he has he doesn't stop talking in the second act shelly the machine levine doesn't stop talking in the second act and he just he just would push that rock up the hill and he's patient on stage i'm not as patient as he is what does that mean patient um, sometimes moments aren't there and he'll wait mm. uh i i I have a bad habit of wanting to overwhelm them and, and willfully, uh, I have a bit of, my bad habit is willfully kind of overwhelming a character. And Al is much more lovely and legato and I'm much more staccato. So I'm still trying to understand like when, how do you feel that the moment is not there? Like what's, what's happening? I'm sorry if I'm getting in the weeds too, too much. I'm just fascinated by all this. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, on film, we can stop and uh, maybe, you have um, 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 some piece of music that maybe you could reconnect to, or there's some poem that your character that has nothing to do with the text. Maybe there's a, an Edgar Allan Poe poem that uh, I'm making this up that would inform how you can get back in there. You can't on stage. There's no, there's no room, and Al's not afraid to make room. Just by being, just by playing with the role until the magic happens, or. The magic's not always going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's just that's the big, that's the big fat lie. Uh, but you still have to tell the story. You still have to engage in the storytelling process. And Al's engagement in in telling the story is a lot different than mine, mm -hmm. which is lovely and fascinating. And so, so you know, you mentioned uh, telling a story. Now with with Stand Against Evil, you're I imagine much more involved in the writing than you've been with with uh, prior shows. Uh, you know, you're a producer of the show. This was, you know, you and Dana Gold kind of were, were in this from, from the beginning. Dana Gold, you were in this from the beginning. What's it like now? Were you able to borrow from your skill, your enormous skill set as an actor and working with uh, great writers before? Were you able to borrow from that skill set and bring it into here? The, the best thing that happened was that Dana and I were peas in a pod on what the tone of Stan should be. And so in other words, because it's comedy horror, and I think I told you that, that it does live somewhere in the middle between The Exorcist and, and Scooby-Doo. So The Exorcist is really scary, but you can't break a joke. And the other end of the spectrum is Scooby-Doo, which is funny, but the monsters are largely declawed. And films like, um, I mean, the, t the, the top of the food chain would be An American Werewolf in London. And Griffin's been on the podcast, by the way. The best. Yeah. So in An American Werewolf in London, what John Landis did, was when that wolf, I don't know if you remember growing up, but that special effect, which was not green screen, um, we saw his, hand, you know, the, the guy, Stan Winston, who won an Academy Award for it, we saw that hand come out and it grew out of uh, Naughton's arm. And then that's really scary, but Griffins can still drop a bomb. So John Landis somehow found how to live in the middle there so that the jokes didn't cannibalize and, and denuder the threat and the threat didn't completely crush the jokes. And that's what Stan wants to live in the middle there. And you can, you can design jokes that completely destroy the threat. And now what do we do? There's no conflict. Everything think, needs conflict. And there's no, so staying in the middle there, like an American werewolf in London is freaking hard. And that's what Dana and I, that tone while we're shooting and in post is what we, we shepherd the, the most. But I, th I think the way you described it is like, you know, Archie Bunker fighting witches. It's that that almost creates the, the, both the horror and the humor because the horror is just witches trying to kill you. It's a kind of classic 
trope of horror. But the idea that this guy is a dealing with his loss and it's almost like a typical John McKinley, not typical because you've played many types of roles, but I feel like this is a, a perfect role for you. Like you have this slightly emotional distance that is covering up a, a pyramid of, of, as you called it, loss or an other trauma and bringing that into a horror where you almost don't give a shit, but you, but you have a heart of gold. That's that, that releases the tension a little bit to make it funny. Right. And when, what that does is ground the protagonist in something we watching you can relate to. Right. Cause if you're just an equal opportunity offender and a big fat jackass, I want to change the channel. Who cares? You know, that's kind of like Dice Clay did that. And it was funny for a second. And then you're like, well, what, what? And so the first, I remember the first time we, the first shot we had to fight for, it wasn't much of a fight, but when we sent Stan coming home in the, in the premiere episode, uh, two, three years ago now, he comes home from losing his wife of 27 years and his job of 28 or however it goes. And he comes home and he goes by the key, the, the stand where you keep your car keys. And he, he puts his hand up and he touches where her now missing keys are. And then we just shot it. It's just a, a cutaway of, of Stan's hand. And we sent it to IFC and they said, it's too sad. And I'm like, fuck you. That's, this guy, he's missing his wife. That shot's, that shot's in the movie. That, that, show, that shot's in the TV show. And they, I was right. And we kept it in. And it's, again, again, you can't make Stan Maudlin and all this and put it up on a billboard. But fuck, man, he's going by this, this key rack, whereas every day, that's what he does when he comes home. He touches it. And now he touches it different because she's gone. And that's a peak, but it's important. And that's what, when you go to these Comic-Cons and you have, the, you have these Q&As with a couple of thousand people, those are the things they connect to. And you're like, great, we're onto something. Yeah, it's interesting. We, um, it, it's never, you know, like the plot of the story, whether it, or the genre, whether it's horror and there's witches and where the witch is from and blah, blah, blah. That's like, you know, drives the show forward. That's why the show exists and so on. But whenever I see Q and A's about television shows, it's never about the plot. It's always about the relationships between the characters. All the questions are about the relationships between the characters. Hundred percent. That's what people connect to. Yeah, and it's and that's the motivating factor. Like you, you feel things, so that's your why in each scene. It's it's if not superficially, then then genuinely validating to go to these Q and A's because that's that's your shit. That's what you said from the beginning that that's what I connect to. And now three years later, you're at some Q and A and someone's responding to something that you did uh, two summers ago in Atlanta or three summers ago. And that feels, you're like, great, great. Cause you can feel when you're doing a, the, a, a, a Glen Gary or if you're doing talk radio, you can damn sure feel it in the room. You know it, you know what people are connecting to. It's a, it's a collaboration we're doing in this, at the Schoenfeld tonight or down at the public. Everyone's, we're all breathing the same air and you can feel it. And the feedback is fucking tangible and it's, and it's immediate and you know, you freaking well know. But when you're doing a TV show, you gotta, you gotta roll the bones here and, and go with what you, what's gonna drive you. And that's, now you got skin in the fucking game. And then to hear two years later, a year later, that somebody take a minuscule piece out of what they watched and stand and go, oh, that reminded me of my dead father. And, it, and all of a sudden they get emotional at the stand asking a question and it's just, it's nirvana. I'm that shallow, it's nirvana. Hey, it's okay to be that shallow. I think, I think, I think everybody is that shallow, but nobody wants to admit it. Well, no, <laughs> it's I know not I see shallow. these actors all the time are like, I don't watch my movie, I don't watch my movies, I don't give a fuck what the audience says. It's like, yes, you do. Yes, you do, that's a big fat lie. Yeah. And, and maybe there's exceptions like James Dean. I didn't know James Dean, but, but I did a movie with Harrison Ford and Harrison genuinely can't, I did a baseball movie, uh, 42, the Jackie Robinson movie. And that's not Harrison's thing. That's not his thing. What, what not to not, it's not care. You're validating him, um, my John McGinley shallowness of being validated by your question at a Comic-Con a Q and A. I don't know, that doesn't, that doesn't resonate for Harrison. It's not a- it, it may be because he became not just an actor, but an icon because of Maybe. you know, Indiana Jones and Han Solo. Like he got his validation early on in this almost, that's part of the, the cultural iconography of American cinema and you know, science fiction and so Maybe. on. So I, I just wonder, but I wanna, I wanna reel back to two things you said earlier or uh, 
One is, you know, when you're trying to find that truth inside of you, part of the job is studying, as you put it, studying men. So what do you mean by studying, you know, studying men or studying people? So which, which, what I find really interesting about men, uh, as I, um, what we do is we try to reflect men's, the male condition. And what's really interesting about men to me is, is what we're afraid of and how men react when they're scared. And uh, some people gain weight. Um, who knows what they're afraid of? They may be afraid of their shadow. They might be what, what that inadequacy is and how that drives them. Some, some of us drink too much. Some of us all of a sudden uh, do blow. Some of us uh, can't, can't talk in public because it's too scary. And uh, some of us uh, marry what we hate and go through chronic divorces. And that's all from what we're scared of. And so if you have the time and energy and, and the intellectual curiosity to, to study that and be around it and, and, and see what, what might, might, might be part of you, and which is really scary, uh, then the lens is gonna, that's gonna, that will be just profound, profound dividends are spawned from that. And so, so like which what every you, acting teacher in the planet who's worth his, his or her salt is gonna encourage you to do. And so how do you, and I imagine this is useful in other areas of life because basically suffering is the human condition from day one. But some people aren't afraid of suffering. I'm talking about what's scary, hmm. what, how, men, how men react to fear. Are you gonna, what are you gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna just punch someone in the esophagus? Is that, what you, is, that, is that how you react to fear? Most of us aren't gonna do that. Are you gonna talk it out? Are you gonna hug it out? Are you gonna leave? What are you gonna do? Those are all different things that resonate for men differently. So what do you do though? Like, like you see someone who's in a high stakes, scary situation in real life, and do you kind of flip into an analytical mode and say, okay, I'm gonna study what happens next. What, how are they moving? What are they doing? What, the, what must they be thinking? And then part two of that question is, how do you see this helping other areas of your life along with acting? Well, most importantly, I like to, if, if you can, when actors can, if you can clock what you did, what you John McGinley did in that scary situation, when uh, the guy at the theater turned around and told your daughter to stop kicking the back of his seat, even though she wasn't kicking the back of your seat. And do I, do I slap you in the back of the fucking head and say, if you turn around again, I swear to God, I'm gonna rip that fucking toupee off and shove it down your throat. Did you, did you say that? Or did you turn to your daughter and go, are you kicking this jackass's seat? Did you stop doing that. And so the, all of a sudden, that's interesting. Uh, what happened? And, and can, we, can we use that and recycle it in front of the lens? In front of the lens, but not only that, in front of um, other high stakes situations you might be in life. Like let's say you're, you're negotiating with a television company about what scenes to, to, to take out of a show and you find yourself getting, reaching that same level of anger. You're obviously not gonna like punch the executive or, or maybe you'll feel like it but you'll sort of catch yourself, maybe, I'm guessing, and say, huh, this is like that, I've, I've created this dictionary of fear for myself, I'm gonna use or, it here. Or, <laughs> or because you have clocked, you the actor have had the, the wherewithal and, and you've been curious enough to explore some of this stuff, when other, things, when other things that might have scared you, like having a discussion with the production entity about cutting a shot, is that no longer something that you're afraid of? That your truth is, no, that's going to be in. So we don't, all of a sudden the mercury doesn't rise. You're like, no, that, that I got, that's gonna be in. You guys are, you're wrong on this, uh, no big deal. Right, so you're able to understand the importance of this particular truth. And, and I imagine with you, you're forceful enough and confident enough in, the, in this truth that they're gonna, Back off. There's something very forceful sometimes, about you. Sometimes, sometimes. I can't sometimes, imagine somebody like really, John, sit back down. I can't imagine someone doing that. Well, I don't, it's not my purse. It's IFC's purse. So ultimately they, I have final cut, but they have, or Dana has final cut. And, uh, but IFC has final cut after that. So ultimately they're gonna do what they want. And it's, it's not an adversarial relationship at all. It's been completely lovely. It's so liberating. I can't even tell you, um, but, you better clock that. You should know where you are in the lunch line. Hmm. 
So you confront that this shot's gonna be in the show and we can have a rational discussion about how important this is and, and why, it, why it, it floats a lot of Stan's transgressions, even though it's just a subliminal two second cutaway shot. And you, we can act like adults and have that conversation so that it's not, it's not this, uh, because that's not gonna float. You and, don't, you don't and, have final cut. And again, it's a skill I mean, a lot of people will get, you know, raise their fists and get angry. And it's a skill developed, again, by studying not, o- not only men and, and people, but also your, your own reactions to high stakes anger situations in the past. Like you have this sort of meta, it's almost meditative. Like, oh, I notice I'm feeling this anger. Hopefully. What, what, what should I do now? And then later on, oh, I'm feeling that same level of anger. Okay, and I'm in this different situation in the hierarchy. Here's how I normally, here, in my dictionary of anger that I've developed because I've been doing this studying, this is how I should react. Yeah, and, and going through the, 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 the bottomless amount of fear you do as a special needs parent, and, and when your child is born in his 21st chromosome triples, and now what does Down syndrome even mean for the first couple of years of your life? And, and everything's scary. What, so, what is the, what are we doing? Who is this person? What is that condition? And, and being overwhelmed by a medical community that largely knows nothing and taking their advice and then over-medicating a child and then learning that you don't necessarily know everything. You're, you're every, the mandate is to over-medicate. So now let's go to doctor four, five, and six and get a sixth opinion to by the guy who's not gonna over-medicate the child and maybe address what the problem is instead of just over, and all that fear and that as a parent, and we all as parents are wildly familiar with, that's the baseline fear for me is what's gonna happen to our children. And especially a child who can't necessarily tell you uh, verbally what's going on. And so now, we're playing guess your best. And who are you, John McGinley, to be guessing your best about what maladies or what, what challenges your son is, is facing? And guess what? Uh, you, can, you can get there. So but when you're scared, it's really hard. So I, I, <clears throat> I imagine, so, so Max, your son, born with uh, Down syndrome, I imagine he's, what, around 18 years old? No, Max is 21 now. 21. So uh, uh, I imagine this you must have had so much experience dealing with fear and of course nonstop i mean it's not right it's nonstop so obviously you've brought this into your life and into into your roles but more importantly into into your family when you first and and stop me if i'm ever getting too personal but when you when you and your wife uh at the time first discover the doctor tells you listen there's a it looks like down syndrome did you consider not having the baby, which are many people? No, we consider? didn't. We didn't have a. We only had a sonogram and a blood protein test, and both of those uh, said that this uh, young girl was going to be perf- perfectly healthy and everything. So we didn't get an amnio um, because the doctor said you don't need it. Everybody's healthy. Do you have any history in your family? No. Uh, so we didn't. So Max came out and he wasn't a girl, and his twenty first chromosome had tripled, and you're in it. Now there's no. Um, you can't abort the birth. <laughs> There's a little package that needs help. What was your, how did you know? So the baby comes out and who said first, there's something wrong? A doctor takes you over to this room and uh, says that the child has all the, has the almond eyes and excuse me, a lot of the physical characteristics of Down syndrome. And then as soon as he or she tells you that it's clear as day, the, your child looks different than everybody else. And not that every child doesn't look like it, uh, different than everybody else, but your child it was born with Down syndrome. It's clear as day. And uh, that's immediately terrifying because what are you even talking about? Because the test that you took, that we took, everything said it was, well, guess what? The, here's, here's the new reality. Your child is born with special needs. Right, so there's, there's kind of a split second of denial and then anger. No, there's a lot of, then you do the whole woe is me and the blame game with yourself. And you how know, could you blame yourself though? Because you're scared and everything's irrational. And right. what, the, what are we doing? This, we were supposed to come in here and have the Norman Rockwell package that we go home with. And that's not what happened. And so now you got to fight your way to the surface and get some air. And so which how is hard? How, you know, now when, so you and your wife, you know, it's it's scary. The one thing that's scary with the first baby, and I imagine 
a, a hundred times more so with with a baby with special needs is then the hospital just sort of discharges you. You go back to your house or apartment and you have a new person living there and it's this little baby. So now you guys are on your own with a baby with that's a little different. Well, we weren't even discharged quickly because uh, Max had, he had a, a cardiac condition. And then as soon as you're discharged, and so we're in the, the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit for about three weeks or so. And then when you are discharged, uh, what presented was a, uh, a brain problem. There were uh, infantile seizures. And so now you see this little baby having these convulsions and what are we doing? What the frick is this? And there's no, there's no map. There's no, this is, you gotta, you gotta figure it out somehow. And you do. And so, so uh, how did you and your wife try to, and I know, you know, this was your first wife, but how did you try to keep your, was there a sense that, look, we also have to keep our own relationship intact while we're dealing with this? No, everything, everything is on the child. That's everything else goes away. And do you think that was related to the, your divorce from your sure. first wife? Um, and then now, of course, you've been, you've been heavily involved in like Down syndrome research. And one thing I've always noticed in the medical community is on the one hand, they diagnose everything with a name, Down syndrome, autism, right. this, that. But on the other hand, every case is individual and it's kind of navigating your way through standardized protocols as opposed to the specific needs of your child. And how do you, is it a matter of having a great doctor? Is it imagine of you being the squeaky wheel, you know? Uh, More squeaky wheel. So you have, to, you have to be an advocate for yourself, even though authority is pushing down on you, knowing this is how we deal. I've dealt with a thousand Down syndrome cases. This is how we deal with it. How do you, how do you, and, and I agree, you, you, everybody needs to keep in mind, they need to be an advocate for themselves and their own family, well, but it's hard against that authority. Especially when you're advocating for people who can't advocate for themselves, which is the Down syndrome community. And so uh, that's a hard one to arrive at. And, and doctors are used to controlling or manipulating. I'm not saying doctors are bad, they help millions of people, but doctors are also used to figuring out how to control the parents who are trying to be squeaky wheels. Sure. And so they're, how do you do, been you there, do it? Done it seen, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. We just, you just continue to not accept what feels not right. And then you got to talk to A, B, C, and then, oh my God, D has something I can connect to. And I don't know how else to put it. Other like than let's that. say there's a doctor who, who came highly recommended, seems good, and they recommend something that to you, in the gut, after observing it, doesn't feel right for Max. Let's say when Max was younger, how would you say, look, we've got to take Max out of this situation? And the doctor's like, listen, this works. This is high stakes. Uh, well, we did it in the NICU when Max had a cardiac condition. They wanted to do open heart surgery because one of his ventricles weren't converting the oxygen, the, the blood from blue to red or however it goes uh, when you introduce oxygen to it. And we said, uh, he said, this can either self-correct or we can impose a procedure. And we we're like, we're not having open heart surgery on this kid who's a day or two old. We just couldn't wrap our head around it for whatever reason. And we didn't, and we didn't have the procedure and it did self-correct. And what did Do you the think you're sleeping? You, you're, you're, you, some Irish jackass from New York is all of a sudden making these decisions based on what? It was our truth. That's what we were doing. And did they, did they say, if you take this little baby out and we just told you he needs open heart surgery, you're, you're endangering the life of the baby? Do they try to? No, they said it might, it could self, it's 50-50. You know, they're looking at you, John McGinley, going, it's 50-50. We could uh, do this protocol, which we recommend, or it might self-correct. Uh, it's 50-50. You're like, what, what are we doing here? What, what is this? This happened, this all happened 96 hours ago, and now I'm making open heart surgery decisions? What, what, what is this? And how did you deal with that? We said no. And how, how did you deal with it personally over the long term that, that this was going to be your life? You sleep for a couple of years. Yeah. And you then stop working and you don't sleep for a couple of years. In the scene in Platoon, where you're basically admitting you think you're not going to make it in, you know, in, in, in the strategy that's being proposed, are, are, I could almost imagine, are you pulling that kind of feeling into the Well, that the was scene? way pre-max, but while we were in the Philippines, my mother had a, a brain procedure up at Pittsburgh Presbyterian 
And I, uh, I called home. I told Oliver, I said, uh, after we had a three, three week boot camp, which was great, um, it was horrifying, but it was great. And then I get this note, or somehow, I don't know how it was communicated to me, but that mom was going up to P- Pittsburgh Presbyterian, and they were going to dr- drill about a quarter size hole in her skull and then do some procedure. And I was like, I'm out of here. I got to go. And so I told Oliver, and he goes, if you go, you're. You, you're not coming back. It's not that kind of, you know, it was a low budget independent movie. And so I called my father who worked on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Don't ask me how I got him because th- nobody takes personal phone calls on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And this is pre cell phones. So there's no way to, there was no way to get you. And the time difference between Manila and New York, I don't know how this happened, but I did get dad on the phone and I said, dad, I'm coming home. And he said, Jumbo, no, you're not. And he meant it. And I could hear him and I didn't come home Mm. and she was fine and I did do the movie. And so by the end of that movie, when I tell Tom, I got a bad feeling about this, I was connected to my mother and, and whether or not I'd done the right thing by not going home and not being a part of a conflict, a medical conflict resolution with my mother. And so the lens knows that. And that was my truth. And I, I kept weeping and weeping and Oliver kept the one take where I'm not a mess. And, but it doesn't matter, the camera knows you're a mess. It's so funny because it's like related to what you said earlier about uh, you know, how people would ask you Q&As and sta- about uh, you know, stand against evil and uh, they would get emotional thinking about their own fathers or whatever. When, I, when you watch that scene in Platoon, I don't think about Vietnam, I think I, you know, the, the kind of fear and sadness you have in that moment, it does make the, the viewer, me in this case, feel things like it brings back memories. And that's what you're, that's, I guess that's the goal of an actor. I don't know if it's the goal, because that's a real mistake. If it's the goal, if, if you're lucky enough, if, if you've availed yourself to being a part of the human condition and studying it and, and bringing mom from Pittsburgh and have the balls to bring her onto the set and, and do that on action, which takes spine, because it hurts. And then maybe some, sometimes things happen. Sometimes they don't, sometimes you're full of shit and you're trying to impose a, a goal. If you're goal oriented on it with, with some emotional, genuine truth, <laughs> Uh, I mean, when I was telling you the story about Pittsburgh Presbyterian, almost I, I was reluctant to do it because I knew I'd break down. But I, I, I decided I wasn't, I just not going to let myself, and I didn't. But I couldn't control it uh, in the Philippines. I couldn't control it. I just, I, I didn't, I didn't want to control it. I wanted that to be part of my truth, and it was my. It wasn't part of my truth. It was my truth. And so, so now, I mean, you've been with Max. You've been through the ringer. You've, you, you've. You've raised him. Um, you know he's he's 21 now. Uh, you're you're actively involved in Down syndrome causes and special needs uh, causes. This has become a, a, a part of your life. Uh, how's Max doing? He's 21. Hey, he's great. Works at Starbucks um, and goes to takes different electives at uh, in Santa, at Santa Monica at a college. And the biggest gift for Max has been in our household has been the growth of his two sisters, uh, Billy Grace, who's 10, and Kate, who's eight, and the introduction of spoken language so that everybody's, loves, everybody's like, with you love unconditionally. Well, they, they have conditions, and now because they have language, they can impose and share those conditions with Max. In other mm. words, a superficial version of this is Max likes loves kisses and hugs from Kate and Billy Grace, and they're like, great, but because you have ketchup and sometimes we have a little drooling problem, you have to wipe your face off and then I'll give you a kiss. And the kiss is based on this exchange. And I watch it and I've, I, it's the greatest thing on the planet. Well, so, so that's an interesting thing. Like, obviously it's terrifying. Parents are, are terrified of something being quote unquote wrong. And yet, so as an example, you, uh, you and I have a, a common friend, it turns out I just realized this the other day and she's writing a book about how, in part, how this is not the title of the book, but how Down syndrome kids are often the happiest people on the planet. Person, we always put the person first: kids with Down syndrome. Kids with Down syndrome. Because you w- wouldn't say a cancer person, right? Okay, so kids with Down syndrome are often the happiest people in the world. I think that's a misnomer. Okay, and by, by the way, our friend is uh, April first. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, so Merrick is—I've uh, known him for 
over 30 years, one of my best friends. I think because a lot of our community uh, is uh, language challenged, it's, uh, it's not fair to assume that they're all lovey-dovey and all that because Max is not always. Hmm. Uh, and nor is he with his sisters and nor is he with me, with me all the time. Um, that gene pool dictates that he's gonna be a real stubborn guy and he is and that has to be okay. Because you, John, are a stubborn Irish prick, and so that has to be okay. Does he? Uh, does uh, I know that this is a naive question, maybe, but does is he fully aware of his situation and how different he is? Uh, I have no idea. Hmm. So you can't tell if he ever gets frustrated. Of I can tell he gets frustrated, mm. but I I don't know about his awareness of his twenty first chromosome tripling. So, so and I'm not being a nudge. I just don't know. Right. So it strikes me with all of these things, whether it's parenting, you know, in a, in a, in a special situation or acting, play acting, working with all these people, kind of the essence of what you do is you, you over prepare and then over deliver. Like your technique for over delivering is to figure out a special way to always over prepare getting a little bit out of that comfort zone for yourself and then delivering on top of that. And it, yeah, but then you, it seems like you, that's your method. Because you've over-prepared, you're more, you're more malleable. You, you, can, you can play with it. Sure. Instead of just grasping what that next verb is or what the, what the frick was, instead what of was, reaching, what instead was John of, Shanley writing when he, what was he talking about in Danny in the Deep Blue Sea at the very end when he's talking to Roberta? What the, 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 the already know that, oh, already know that. And so when you get into a new situation, whether now it's- Now you're liberated your shoulders can go like this and you can be available to some stunning thing the actress does that night that you didn't see coming that, uh, oh my God, in the middle of the scene, James, uh, James knocked his microphone off. And guess what? It's the most magic thing ever because McGinley responded to it and he caught it on the fly and this was, this was why we were shooting. And then James all of a sudden was, uh, it, it made him really laugh and had the most genius laugh in the history of the world. And it, it, we never saw James that way before. And it all came out of this great mistake that they go, both could, that they were nimble enough to shadow box with because they'd done this, whether they'd done enough performances or, or done enough homework, they could absolutely roll with it. And when actors are in that, that flow state, you always hear um, athletes talking about being in a flow state. When actors get in a flow state, magic shit happens. And you I, can't will yourself into a flow state. You so can't. When you, when you try to do something new, like let's say writing a, a script for Stand Against Evil uh, or, or whatever, uh, how do you borrow from that, that skill set of over preparing and over delivering in something brand new? Like, how did you over prepare when you started writing things? Um, I guess at that point, when you have, and I only shape Stan, Dana writes it, mm. I shape it. I don't ever want there to, uh, geez, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Um, but be, being, being liberated to offer a suggestion, which a lot of times as actors, we, we think we're supposed to stay over here and then we'll hit our mark and we'll say our line and we don't wanna cause any trouble because the, the overriding mantra is to get another job. And so you don't wanna be the fly in the ointment guy and, and you don't wanna um, be suggesting things to a micromanager who might be the producer or, or director and now be the guy who steps on everybody's toes. And so we largely stay over here and we mind our business and we really just want to flourish in this moment that, that we're going to do. And so uh, what's happened with this college of experiences and who I want to be with, or the only people I'll be with, is people who will take some of my input because mm. uh, that's how we're going to do this. Otherwise, you definitely should get someone else. Mm. And it's no big deal. Mm. It's, I don't give two fucks. But I want to either do this together with you or it's fine. I'll just be in Malibu. I'll be I'll be surfing and lifting weights. It's fine. So so part of it is part of the the going into something new is making sure you're around the right people, good people who are going to make you the best you could be. And then part and of allow it, me to make you the best you can be. Right. Right. Take your by taking your input. And then part of it also I imagine is like for instance, you quoted from American Werewolf in London, you quoted from uh you know 
Archie Bunker. Uh, I've heard you talk about The Exorcist in terms of standing against evil. So you've obviously built up a knowledge of the genre that you might not have had before, and you were able to study that and figure out what you wanted. So that was probably a little bit of the over-preparation into going into shaping this. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying then, to figure out the John McGinley technique for anything. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, hopefully that gets, uh, I don't know if the, if the human condition has a, has a process for everything that's malleable enough to plug into everything. And so hopefully actors are, are, are flexible enough and sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're, we're stuck in our ways and here's how we're gonna do this. And then you're fucked. Or w- sometimes that serves you and you're not gonna drown if you're in some piece of shit and you know you are you know, and it's going down, how are you gonna not drown? How are you gonna stay authentic and be and contribute to the storytelling process? And that might be from all the homework you did at NYU and, and what served you when you were doing Glengarry and what worked in talk radio and, and how did Platoon, in, and now this thing's going down, but shit, McGinley was okay in it. So, so authentic's interesting because it relates to the, the, maybe one of the last questions I have, which is, you mentioned in the beginning all of the rejections and how you just it's just overwhelming and and most people i know who have gone out to la to try to be actors have, have sooner or later quit after the first 100 rejections how did you find the resilience is it part is it realizing this core authenticity that you're an actor and you know you have it or what no, is it i work i work with young actors all the time and i tell them and I'm not trying to be a tough guy because I'm not, but I tell them, if you have a plan B, if you're just going to come out here for a year or two, whether it's New York or Los Angeles, um, and you have a plan B, definitely do the plan B because mm. it's going to work out better. Mm. You asked me why I did it. I had to do it. I had to. There was no, it was as clear as day. This is what I had to do. Could- to me, in my core, I knew I had to participate in storytelling. I didn't know what that looked like, but I knew I was gonna be a storyteller. But that's interesting though. So you had an umbrella storytelling as opposed to like, I'm gonna be an action hero in a movie. 100%. I didn't so, even know what that meant. I, I, I do know what you mean, but that uh, I, I didn't have an objective other than I knew I had to, I'll tell you what's interesting. One year um, I was up at Syracuse. I transferred to Syracuse for one year when I was a figure, in a figuring it out phase. And up Syracuse so cold um, that once the, once the cold sets in on the side of that hill, it's on the side of this hill. And so this lake effect blows this cold air up against the university. And if you wanna get some physical fitness in, it has to be indoors. And so I decided I'd try to fight a boxer, just train and, and you know, indoors and see what, see what could happen. And I did it and I got, I got pretty nimble um, in a physical fitness way. And so the guy, uh, I think his first name was Packy, the trainer who you pay, you know, 30 bucks to, you know, to teach you to, what to do. And so I was there for about four or five months and he goes, you want to spar? And I'm like, yeah, cause I was ready. And I was about 178, 182, which is where all the freak athletes are right around 182. So a, a light heavyweight or a, a heavy welterweight. And uh, so I got in with this guy and he got the headgear on and all, and I, I could, I could move around the ring and, and stay away and stay away. And then he hit me in the liver, you know, the biggest organ in your body next to your skin. And it buckled me. It was just a, it was just a good shot, just one shot. And it buckled me and Packy saw it and he goes, okay, 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 good, 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 good. And I continued to train, but my takeaway was, it was as clear as that. I can remember like it was right here, that unless you have to do this, you shouldn't. Hmm. Boxer, the only good boxers are boxers who have to do it. And I tell actors this all the time, that unless you have to do this, definitely do something else. How do you think somebody can find what it is they have to do? I don't know. Because you sort of fell into it as a young age, but now we live in this world where jobs and industries are changing. People are trying to figure out what their second, third, even fourth lives are into, into older age. Uh, you know, But they've been so used to being, oh, I'm gonna just show up for my cubicle every day. How do, you, how do you break out of that? I don't that? know, I got lucky. I didn't have an epiphany or, or some archangel visit me or I just knew somewhere in some kind of Irish heritage or, or whatever it is we're blessed or cursed with, I knew I had to be part of a storytelling process. I knew. And, and, and with not, without having a plan B, was your reaction to rejection, was it more, ugh, they don't know what they're doing or was it, I'm gonna figure out how to improve a little bit more? A little of both. I think there has to be some arrogance and some willfulness early on. 
Um, mm. And there has to be also this, this commitment to perseverance, because this is gonna suck. Unless you're some beautiful boy or girl and you get that thing for a year or two where you know, we all know them, everybody's either absolutely gorgeous and it's gonna work for a film or two. And then you're gonna go away. Well, I was never that guy and nobody I knew was that guy or girl and uh, or knew well. And so it, that was never part of my, my thing. For instance, um, we, uh, there used to be a, ca a casting place down on 33rd by the, by the post office. There was a casting place called Donna DeSetta. And we'd all go there for auditions and for mostly commercial auditions. And it was up about, I don't know, uh, 15, 20 stories. And you'd go in there and you'd, you'd read the copy and then you'd go in front of the lens and you'd do the Colgate thing and whatever. And so Ken and Barbie would invariably be the, the, what they were, the business model they were looking for were Johnny Beautiful and, and Sarah Beautiful. And they used to pair me and Franny McDormand as the alternate couple all the time. That's we so funny. Anti-Barbie, anti-Ken. And so Franny and I, oh my God, it must have happened, I don't know, three, if it happened three, it happened four or five times. And I'd see Franny McDormand and we would be the, um, you know, they'd, they'd show a couple of beautiful young actors and then they'd bring in, and they'd always preface it with, now um, they'd have all the ad executives right here and somebody would go, well, now if we were gonna go the other way, and what the fuck is the other way? In other words, troll actors. If we were gonna go the other way, we'd probably go with this Irish donkey McGinley and Franny McDormand, who's always been the most interesting person in, in the history of any lens. And they'd put us, we never booked a single commercial. That's so funny. So in other words, you two aren't that beautiful. Um, you're not really what they're looking for, but uh, just come up and sashay a little bit for us and now go. And so we did it. And then what made you continue? Because I'm not fucking Ken. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the Irish jackass in the corner who was bitter about everything. So, what, and, and A, what made you continue? And what made you realize, okay, now it's starting to click? I think fatigue <laughs> informs a lot of things. And so stuff stops hurting so much. Huh. It doesn't, sooner or later you figure out what, what hurts and what, what doesn't rate as hurtful. That doesn't hurt. That's a that's a lark. Yeah, and then and then when in your career did you say ah finally, what I dreamed of is starting to happen? Uh, probably early on uh, when I got to understudy John John Totoro uh, John Totoro and Danny in the Deep Blue Sea two weeks before he, out of getting get it out of NYU grad, I was also the assistant stage manager and I make I made up John and I made up his knuckles. He had to have. Um, rubber prosthetic pieces put on his hand. And so I would make up the actors. I helped June Stein, who was this miraculous actor. Um, and then I didn't call, I wasn't on the light board, but I did call the house and I had the keys to the theater. And so uh, I lived in a funeral parlor on Sullivan Street, in the New Chironi funeral parlor. And so because that was only about 85 yards from the funeral parlor, uh, Circle in the Square, which used to be on Bleecker Street, um, I would go every day and I would unlock the theater and then I would lock it. And um, it was a thrust stage and it was about three quarters. And so I would go and do the whole play. I would do June, June's lines and mine almost um, in a meditative state. I would just do it. And I would roam the stage for about two hours hmm. before my voice gave out. And I did that for almost five months before John finally went to do Desperately Seeking Susan with Madonna. And then I got to go on for about, I don't know, five performances. Uh, but I was ready. I'd done the play three hours a day, both roles, uh, for five months. And again, it's that it's that severe over preparation. No one else had done that. But it was fear based. Yeah. And I don't. I don't. Fear based in a good way, because I think sometimes I think fear, fear decisions based in a good are bad way too. Yeah. Uh, because it yielded a really productive uh, result. And so when somebody from an assistant to an assistant to an assistant casting person from Oliver Stone's film Platoon, and this is in 84, uh, came down to see John, he was off doing Desperately Seeking Susan. And so they saw me. And so in 84, I was cast as this tiny little role in Platoon. And then it went down because the financing went away. And then two years later, it was resurrected uh, with new financing. And Oliver called and said, McGinley, do you, do you want to play the fourth lead? You want to play Sergeant O'Neill? And I couldn't because I was doing Hamlet at the public with Kevin Klein, this big important Hamlet that all of us in New York wanted to be in. 
And I was third guy on the right and playing seven roles, but it didn't matter because I was understudying Laertes. And the first two weeks of any Hamlet is, is the sword fight preparation for Laertes and Hamlet at the end of the play, because the, you know, it's the finale of the play. And we were with B.H. Barry, who was the fight director of De Jour at the time. And I was about a week and a half into the fight choreography. Uh, and I had to be there because I was understudying Laertes. And it was, it was heaven, man. And then Oliver calls and says, Do you, I, mean, I want you to play Sergeant O'Neill. And so I, I said, I'm doing Hamlet. And he said, and I said, over at the public. And he said, well, go, go tell Joe. And I'm like, oh, oh I'm going to call Mr. Pap Joe. <laughs> you know, stop. <laughs> and I, I eventually went in to have a meeting with uh, Mr. Pap, and it was tantamount to going in to see The Wizard and The Wizard of Oz. And I asked him if I could, if I left to do this movie, would I still be able to stay in the fraternity? Because all of us wanted to be in that fraternity slash sorority at the Shakespeare Festival, because once you got in, they used you over and over. It was kind of an extended ensemble. And uh, Ms. Papp said, if you go, we'll, we'll do Hamlet again. And that was code for, yes, you can go. And I did, and the minute I left, the revolution started in the Philippines. And so in the Manila, uh, uh, Ferdinand Marcos lost an election, but he, but he decided that being there was really good, so he stayed. So the film was postponed and forever. And I stayed in the funeral parlor and I watched the revolution on CNN and Kevin's Hamlet opened and it was the most important Hamlet on these shores. And I'm sitting there in the, in the goddamn funeral parlor thinking, you know, you're the biggest loser in the history of the world. Pl Platoon was not gonna happen. It was gonna be canceled again. And the day then it, the, 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 the revolution um, resolved and so we got the call to leave. And the minute I, I'm leaving, I'm walking down the stairs of the funeral parlor and who's coming in to shoot exteriors for Moonstruck, but Cher is walking into my funeral parlor hmm. and I'm going to the Manila to shoot some piece of shit, low budget independent film. And I'm like, Cher, who was trading at her all time high, she'd win an Academy Award for it. And I'm like, I, I really, am, I suck at decision, career decision making. I, this is just, this is a disaster. And I said hi to Cher on the, on, the, on the landing. And she's just like, hello. And I'm like, I fucking love you. <laughs> but I couldn't love her. I had to go to Manila. And I did. And then the rest worked out. You know, it's always those low points. It People was a low never point. guess. <laughs> God damn, that Hamlet. I'd love to go back and read that review. But it was all that. It was all that. So, so, so now it's, uh, what is it, 34 years later, Stand Against Evil, coming out October 31st, Halloween. Your producer, shaper, uh, main actor, Sheriff Miller. Uh, uh, there's so many other questions I want to ask you, but I'm being, I'm being told it's time to wrap. Will you come on again at some point? Yeah, I love, I love this. I love the, the, what we do. So, uh, so next time, just so I remember, I want to... I want to talk about the shape of media in general because it's uh, obviously you've seen it change his, you know, so many times in the past 30, 40 years and other stuff. There's so many things to talk about with you. So John McGinley, thanks so much. Stand Against Evil. And of course, loved you in all the movies and scrubs and everything. And you're such an important actor and influence on so many others. Thanks again for coming on the podcast. Cheers, James. It's thanks. a pleasure to be with you. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.